Welcome back to The Mentors. This is Vadim. And Sergey. And this is a show where we tell stories of ordinary people that became extraordinary entrepreneurs despite lack of experience, money, or connections. That's right. I probably repeat that uh, how many times already? Oh, actually, 71. This is our 71st episode. <laughs> Specific time. Yeah. So you guys better have it memorized by now. Okay. Today on the show, we actually have a really exciting guest, Micah Brown who actually I met through a business plan competition that we held for the university where I teach. And Micah, you were kind enough to come on as a judge. Yep. So I knew right away that your story was really awesome and I wanted our audience to hear about it. But let me give our audience a little bit of context at first. Right now, you are a general partner and founder of Sentiment Capital uh, Seed investment fund yep, correct. that you started when? I started that four months ago, actually. Yep. Okay, very brand new, so we'll touch on that and how you got started with that. Yep. Uh, before that, you were founder of a startup, an ad tech startup by the same name, actually, Sentiment. Yep. Uh, and before th- <laughs> That's right. You might as well, if it works, why not? Uh, it's part of your brand. Before that, you were founder of Film Funder, which you also sold, mm-hmm. so those, that's your second startup that you sold. And you've done a bunch of stuff. You were a lecturer at City College of New York. You're an advisor for deep learning at NUMA, which is an accelerator in New York. You've done product at NBC Universal, Viacom. You've been in finance at Barclays. You've done a whole hell of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Uh, and we love those types of people because we talk a lot about switching careers, doing different things because, let's face it, we get bored. That's why we're entrepreneurs. We do. Uh, but, you know, you've done the corporate thing. You've done the startup thing. But let's go back to, I guess, earlier on in your career. When do you feel like you caught the entrepreneurial bug? Because I know that you started off tinkering with computers and programming at 16, which is super nerdy. By the way, a super attractive guy here we have uh, from South <laughs> London. <laughs> 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 By New York standards, I'm like a five. You know? <laughs> Check out his Instagram it's at uh, Micah Brown Official if you want a confirmation of that. But how did you get how did you get into entrepreneurship? Yeah, so you know what's super interesting. I feel like I was like a low key entrepreneur for a long time. I was in the nine to five world, right? So you know, I grew up like in South London, Catford. Uh, I both my parents really cool, but it's like it's a dangerous area. You know, we didn't grow up with much money, and so it was like stay down the line, just like go to school, achieve. And so I did that. And then um, that culminated in kind of graduating at 20 uh, with honors. And I actually got this thing called a Royal Honorary at Uxbridge College, hmm. where basically like they just give you these accolades for being smart, which was great. Did you meet the queen? I actually got to meet Prince Charles. Oh. There's a picture of that somewhere on LinkedIn and, and, and uh, Instagram, I think, as well. So, did he yeah. have hair? He had a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he has less now. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So anyway, long story short. So that was like, okay, yeah, I did earn money and... Uh, so like but it's funny because on the side I you know I used to do little things I had this thing called iFlux which was like a consulting business straight out of school and basically I just ran like four or five contracts simultaneously I hired some people to like work it's like a little recruitment agency and so there were little things on the way but really it was like for the first few years of my life probably until about 24 5 it was yeah no go to work earn money or you die like literally (laughs) if you're not at work when you're earning money you will just shrivel up and be Gandalf and die so. so it sounds like you, for a long time, you you wanted to start a business. You wanted to make more money, it sounds like. Yeah. But it makes sense. I mean, it, being immigrants ourselves, we also had to follow the, you got to graduate, you got to get a job, at least have that security, and then you can do whatever you want. So when you would come home from work, what would you do? Did you constantly tinker and work on stuff? Yes. Why do you say that? So I started, I really started coding at 14, actually. So I don't know if you guys remember Amstrad 64s or Commodore 64s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they're in the game, it has MS DOS as the operating system. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, actually, what was the name? Kronos. Mm. Um, oh, what was the name of the game? I can't remember now. Was, the main character is Kronos. The this, plight of the nerd is uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And like this game had this loop where like it's on MS DOS, you can't get past a certain level unless you're like doing all these different things. And I just got really annoyed and frustrated. And so there wasn't, you know, like Google stuff was on Google, but it wasn't like it is now. And so I just started looking at the source code. Hmm. And then I found all these loops in the source code and I just hacked the game. Sick. And I did that at 14 and, you know, I was like, oh, this is so cool. And so then just little things like that. And then uh, my attendance records when I was in school. So like <laughs> sidebar, like I was, I always got like consistently high grades and um, towards the end of school, like just a couple of times I was off, but I like wanted to be a model citizen, model citizen, model student, whatever. And um, yeah, so when it came to parent teachers evening one time, like my mom was like, oh, Michael, why have you missed like these three days? I was like, <laughs> yeah, because you no, know, I'm sorry. And then to get into the college that I wanted to, I, I had to be like full attendance. And so I just changed it on the system. 
and people didn't find out for years. So it's like this little that, you know, a little bit of. Hold uh, on, you've changed it, uh, your attendance on the system. You yeah. like hacked into the back end and. And he, what, he's nodding someone, right now. <laughs> did someone find out eventually? It was like years later. What did they do or what did they say to you? It was, it was actually my old teacher, Mrs. Muggage. She emailed me. She was like, Mike, I'm pretty sure in 2005 that you were not at half of your classes. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> so it was like, that was cool. Um, but yeah, so it's just little things like that. And then what I really got interested in um, was database engineering. And I like took a deep interest in that. In my uh, 16th year, you just in England, you do GCSEs, you like lots and lots of subjects, and you specialize in like four, and one of mine was computing. But what was crazy was like the computing programs weren't really about programming, which was crazy. It was like logic and math, and like how to open a zip folder, and all this really stupid stuff. And so I just like blew through my entire computing program in like the first month. And then it was like, it became a class where I could just do whatever I wanted. So this is how you know I was just bored when I was in my final year at school. like. One night I was just there just messing with um, Shark VPN. I was like, oh, look, I can get to this node. What is this node? And then like, there was this, this, this other thing which allows you to control cursors. So I'm just moving this random cursor around on this person's machine. I didn't know who's. <laughs> so long story short, it's like six, seven at night. So then <laughs> Mr. Williams, who was like our deputy head teacher, like comes, this is the IT room. And he just comes in and he sees it's me. And he's like, it's you moving my cursor around, isn't it? I was like, Oh yeah, sorry. Cool. <laughs> I won't do that again. Thanks. Now, how did he find out? He just knew like who else is. Well, they, they, I think you must have called up the IT guy and said, "This is the IP it's coming from, oh, and it's up here and whatever." Anyway, you so, didn't mask your IP or something. <laughs> no, I was amateur back in the days. Nowadays, I would have used a daemon and I would have bounced off like multiple different servers and be on tour. But you yeah. learned. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, do you think sort of this, I guess, techie background, even being interested in database engineering, do you think this set you up to that in the future? You know, because you, you recently started a fund and yeah. we talked about a few weeks ago when I met you how you got really excited about like investment dynamics and yeah. diving deep into the different terms and, yeah. and I guess really breaking down what it's like to be an effective investor. Do you think that is part of the same yeah. personality? You know, you know, I think about like something simple like the Burkers model right, versus book value and the Volkers. All these like little nerdy things, which actually quite a lot of the time don't make their way into VC parlance, but they're very, very prevalent in the institutional funding world, right? So like, you're not gonna get through a serious private equity deal without a PPM for a, a private placement. I don't, I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but like these kind of things are very prevalent in that world. And VCs just ended up being these guys who get to do whatever they want uh, with sometimes little accountability, very little, especially if they have a greenfield fund, which they've had exits on or whatever, it's just their money. And and it's just like, I think it's very ripe for innovation. Like now I'm getting to know other VCs here in the New York scene. Like, you know, even one of the things that we do is, is called IP syndication. And actually just today, I closed this partnership with this awesome company called Knowledge Base Capital, mm -hmm. um, Patrick Wolovec, cool dude. It's basically with him, what we do is we've built this IP valuation software, which distinguishes someone's IP really is worth something or it isn't. And then the software underneath is called IP We, and we've designed another piece of software that sits on top of some AI. And so just something like that, you know, I I've spoken to other funds that have said, well, how did you do that? That replaces our associates and that's so efficient. I'm like, I just sat and thought about it. Like, <laughs> why haven't you done that? And so it, I like to look at how you know, data science and machine learning can be applied in these environments to optimize things and innovate. So, yeah. That's interesting that you say that uh, VCs don't really have a lot of accountability. In fact, in the contracts, when you create the fund, the contracts between your LPs and you as a general partner, GP, state that you get to make independent decisions. Now, you have to report every year, of course. So you, there's some accountability, but you're the one who makes the investment decisions and they can't touch their money. Of course, right. you can't piss them off too much because otherwise they'll never invest in your fund again. Exactly. But that's, that's the case. So that's really interesting. Uh, and I want to get back to a little later about this interesting AI model you built to, to figure out the value of IP. I think that's pretty cool. What would you say was the first time that you had an idea or you pursued something that you thought could actually be a business versus just tinkering around with something? Well, it's funny because the first time I did do that, it made $70 million. Um, so amazing lady. Actually, I just did some little consulting work for a daughter on, on sort of a fashion brand she's launching a couple of days ago. Nina Boone. I think Nina... Nina really changed my life. Like, so, so just to give you my career trajectory, so I was like, go out of school at 16, was working in retail banking, literally hacked some of the retail banking systems to make them better. Then that got me into credit risk, where I basically worked on these things called SIV lights, which were the products underneath asset backed securitized collateralized obligations, which were the big things that did the mortgage crisis. Was at Barclays for a little bit more, left Barclays, 
was at school at the same time as Barclay, he did my computer science degree, did the, the, the royalty thing, um, came out of that, then basically went to work in the investment banking world as a consultant. And I started this thing called iFlux, which is just really like an agency, um, it's basically a recruitment agency for investment banking skills. And I, was, I would go and I'd go on site and I'd do certain things. Did that. After iFlux, um, I basically got the chance to work at Aon. And I actually started there as an admin assistant. Hmm. So it's funny because like, at the time, my family had just got on green cards. We all like said, goodbye, England, bye, you're miserable, we're going. <laughs> and we literally like, <laughs> that's so crazy. We left our, in, our homes behind. Like the mortgage was unpaid. There was still stuff in there. We just took suitcases with us. It was like, it was like an American fantasy, like Jamestown level 1907 stuff. Well, are you uh, saying you have a warrant for your arrest or something? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, they're going to come and get me. <laughs> <laughs> so like literally we left and then we came to my uncle's house in Florida. And it was like, I'd, I'd been there when I was younger, but something about going there as an adult and like being on Miami beach and being in the sun all the time. It was like a fantasy that was not real. <laughs> and then I got this job working at this company called K-Force, just like little support stuff. And there was lots of bouncing around, like a really unstable time. And then I came back and uh, I just needed a job. But like, it had been really hard for me to get engineering jobs. It was, at that time, it was really hard to get entry level engineering jobs in the UK. But cause I'd done it in the US, it just made it easier. So I just took an admin job at Aon. And so I'm in this job at Aon and it's literally like transposing stuff, like stuff that's written down, just case policy stuff being transposed to this database. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? If you just scan that all and like lift it and put it in a spreadsheet, you can take this process like that's taking people an hour each and do a hundred of these. That's what I did. I just scanned all the paper and then I just got these VLOOKUPs um, from some OCR software which was reading the paper and then I put the VLOOKUPs in and it cross-referenced what the policy math was. And that was like 10 lines of VBA code. And then I went to have coffee. This is my first day. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you guys know anything about English society, but like there's like what I call like the Oxbridgeonians. Like they're in mid-level management positions. Um, my boss's name was Peter at the time and he came and was like, are you drinking coffee, Micah? <laughs> Why are you not working? And I was like, because I did my work already. He's like, it's not possible for you to do your work. You have 150 caseloads assigned today. I was like, no, I did uh, 400. He's like, what do you mean you did 400? I was like, I did 400 cases. I transferred 400 cases, go and check Bridge, which is the system. So he checks it, there's 400 cases on there. He's like, how did you do that? <laughs> and I showed him, I was like, it's 10 lines of VBA code. You scan the stuff, there's OCR, and then you put it into a VLOOKUP. He was like, huh. <laughs> and then the next day they like fired everyone. There was like 10 people there. Wow. And, um, and they basically like built this, well, they were already building it. It was called the data control team. And they put me in that. And I was basically at that time just running that system on its own. And then he was building like this big data warehouse initiative to take all of the information that they had, which is all on paper and put it into databases. And so that's where I really learned database engineering. And like, I basically like, there was different teams, vendors, so many, I learned so much about project management there as well. Like vendors came, they tried to shyster us, like they left. There were people that came, whatever. But I was basically the only consistent engineer until I ended up running it by the time I left. And then, yeah, I just, I built this data warehouse from scratch. <laughs> And then that really propelled me. So bring it back to Nina, sorry, and then I'll compress it a little bit because it's a long story. Um, yeah, moved move to the US. Um, and basically like, at that point, I saw these brokers uh, on the 35th floor at 199 Water Street, which is where Aon is here in New York. And they were like doing these really manual processes and they had these massive expenses and like big expense accounts. And I'm like, the math of our entire region is $34 million on $20 million of spend. Like just shy of $10 million of profit. Why is that? And then, so I'm looking at these expenses and I'm like, cool. So really what's happening here is business isn't being closed in a certain timeline and sometimes people are off in the Maldives. Okay, cool. So what if I just expose that? Which is what I did. So I took Salesforce and I reconciled it with our billing system and I created a report, which was just like, put everyone in the light. Hmm. And then Nina, she's really good at this. She just used it as a hammer. She's, sidebar, she's basically castrating everyone, all the men in the insurance industry. She literally just won an award for that. It was amazing. <laughs> anyway, so we did that. And then, yeah, it changed the margins to $70 million. And I was like, wow, this idea that I had just boom, it just exploded. Hmm. And so since then, it's like, then I did that uh, basically at Viacom and NBC. Then I did it for myself at Film Funder. And then I did it again at Sentiment. And now I refined it into a funding process. Interesting. So it sounds like your first entrepreneurial experience was actually an intrapreneurial experience. And this is really important to take away from this conversation because there's a lot of people right now that are stuck in jobs. And they might not love it, but almost every single company or team or any kind of organization is going to have some inefficiencies there. And one way to stand out in, in the way that you seems like stood out even in the very beginning and you ended up leading a team and then moving on and doing it somewhere else is actually trying to create efficiencies and solve problems where other people haven't identified the problems. And when you do that, 
you surprise people and they see you as the expert and of course give you more responsibilities. I had the same thing happen in my first finance job. It was doing some also sort of back office administrative work. And I remember one day I was just sending faxes and filling out this paperwork compliance shit. And I was like, this sucks. Like, I don't want to do this. And it's taken hours. I was actually really interested in, uh, in angel investing as well. Yeah. I, was, I was just actually reading on following different investors on Twitter and reading their information. I want to spend more time on that. So I ended up doing something similar and just putting together some simple macros to automate our end of day uh, settlements and my boss would be like well why didn't you do all these other steps and I'm like well you don't have to this is just a waste of time so I'd have meetings with my boss and he'd be upset because I didn't do the fake work that they had but they kept on giving me more responsibilities and so it's kind of ironic because other people that are sort of used to the way things are they're a little bit uh, they, they don't like change right let's face it but if somebody like you comes in and shows them hey you can save millions of dollars uh, they'll they'll listen to you so it yeah. sounds like you're an entrepreneur but then film funder right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. was your would you say beyond the consulting or recruiting agency that you started before that was that your first oh yeah independent definitely. entrepreneurial and I'll tell you why like mm-hmm. I think Gary says this well you gotta fail to actually succeed mm. The entrepreneurs that I know that didn't fail at their first endeavor went on to raise big venture rounds and then fail when they did that. And I can't tell you how I've, up close and personal, I won't say it, but like these guys, it is such a bubble bursting moment when you just raise like a hundred million dollars and somehow you can't get your business to work. Cause like up until now, as far as you, from 30 under 30, and all this stuff was happening and you just can't get your business to do what you want it to do because you don't have the skills. So I'm glad that I failed on, on Film Fund. And then later, I mean, I sold it this year. So, you know, it, it wasn't a total failure. And so, yeah, basically I failed, but it was a good failure because yeah, I came out of NBC and there was this episode basically where I was in, in this production meeting. So my responsibilities there were, I was a portfolio manager for all the products for the late night show. So that's transcoding, encoding, digital syndication, anything to do with getting like a piece of content to TV, right? Mm-hmm. And I was seeing this production meeting, this guy came in with an idea for a TV show. And basically this kind of TV show, oh, this is amazing. Micah, can you sit and give us the numbers on it? It's called Nielsen Numbers and whatever about like how successful this TV show might be. So like four or five production teams, black dude. And um, <laughs> throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was pitching this amazing TV show, but he had nothing to support, no numbers, no data to support. It was just about empowering black people on TV. And uh, then like they looked at me and they were like, oh, would this work? I was like, according to the numbers, no. I mean, like the, the, the verticals, genres and everything that he's talking about just haven't been done before. They're unproven. So I'm having to sit there and stop a dude with like a legitimately convincing idea about empowering black people on TV from getting his show on NBC. Mm. And then it went to Fox and then it became like one of the biggest shows in the history of TV. No way. What was it called? I can't say that, but yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. If you look, it's, it's pretty obvious. Like it, it's on Fox. It's by a black dude. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that happened. And then... After that, I was like, hold on a second. So in that meeting, literally, basically what happened is because he didn't have any focus group data, he couldn't demonstrate what he knew emotionally and what he knew within his gut. And what anybody who knows anything about this market knows, but just doesn't have any data for. How many filmmakers experience that, right? And so I was like, okay, what if I could build a product that could help people like him, people further down the chain, specifically film students? Mm. And that's what the original idea of the product was like. Take IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, Box Office Mojo, data in those places, and forget like super sophisticated anything. Just look at footfall. Like how many people go to watch films in certain places based on those data sources? And does your film and the genre of your film line up with that? Yes, it does. Great. It's a success. No, it doesn't. You should change something. And yeah, like filmmakers started using it. And then a key part of it as well was the OIX, which is this tax credits platform. And what we basically do is um, the filmmakers would get their tax credits. I'd sell them on the platform and it was a way without crowdfunding or lending for them to make money. I did it a few times myself, but the administrative overhead just became a lot. Mm -hmm. And so between those two things, I had lots of proof of concepts. I put my own money into it. I I went broke, put my own money into it. And then I just couldn't raise any money because people at the time couldn't get it. Like now they do. What because, did it actually do? Yeah. What was like the core? So function? the support vector machine. So basically it just took time and, and footfall from all these data sources. And it told you how many people were going to go and watch a film. And it gave you a visual and it gave you a number and it gave you a way to express it to uh, people who would make decisions in like one PDF. You didn't have to think about it. Boom, bam, give me some money for my film. Interesting. Did you, did you ever run that model against the, the concept that this guy had that pitched NBC? Yeah, and it, it was it came out. I was just it was Empire, like it was just like it came out like what it came out to be, which was billions of dollars, and it broke Nielsen records. Hmm. Um, so 
so yeah, and we had lots of other validators. At NYU, one of the things we did is we got like, I think 30 filmmakers in a room who all hadn't got their films funded yet. And I did the process with every single one, tax credits, everything, and every one of them got, in some ways, some traction or in some cases, like direct funding for their films. And so there was all this traction, but the big thing about it was just like, people weren't ready mentally for the idea in the studios, which ultimately were the decision makers because they were the ones buying. The consumers were the ones with the attention. I had lots of that, but I needed people to buy stuff. Um, to invest in it, to use it. They were, and then Netflix came along and put them all out of their jobs, which is mm. great. So, <laughs> which is why I got acquired this year. Like, you know, Barry Park Entertainment, which is the uh, company that acquired it, is connected to Netflix and, and Amazon, all these guys, and he's using the model with them now. So, How long did you run it for? Uh, I actively run it for about a year, and then it kind of came and went in different ways for two or three years. Got it. So how did the acquisition come about? Tell us about yeah. that story. So long story short, Mark Downey, really cool dude. Uh, he's done a few films, been a few producer, a few big films, mostly black films, some stuff on BET, um, different channels as well. Check him out when you get a chance. Um, he runs Barry Park Entertainment, which is this kind of like uh, film financing company backed by uh, lots of different investors. And he basically, you knew it for like two years. And he was just watching close to the studios as people he knows at the studios lost their jobs or went to Facebook or went to Amazon or went to Netflix. And like literally now, I don't know if you know this, but like the studio system is not the same. Their hands are tired. Like unless there are a billion different variables which support a film, like a multiple um, instantiated franchise like Transformers, which is why they keep making Transformers films. Mm -hmm. um, you can't bring new ideas to the studio system because they just can't take the risks. But Netflix is taking all the risks because they've got data. And so that was the idea, like put data behind your, ind at the time, independent and later on the model was like more like theatrical budget level films. And once you have data, then people can't argue with you. So, yeah. So this guy Downey, you, you knew him? How did you meet him? Yeah. So I actually met him at um, Rainbow 2020, which is this thing that Jesse Jackson does every year that I get invited to. And it's like all these black people from like, you know, activists and different people. I was at Mark's table and I started telling him about Film Funder. And by that time it was like, I was doing sentiment full time. He was like, this is amazing. What are you doing with it? I was like, nothing. And he was like, oh, okay. So then like a year goes by, he used it on a couple of different productions. And then his main investor, like I got to meet his main investor, who's like this investment banker, multimillionaire dude. And um, he was like, yeah, we should buy this. So you, use, you should use it for Barry Park Entertainment. So they did. And that was like eight months ago now. That's really cool. So what, what was that like? They, they said we should buy this and you have this asset. How do you even start understanding how to negotiate that sale? Well, first of all, a book I would recommend to anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur, much less to be a VC, Brad Mendelson and Jason Kalkanis, Be Smarter Than Your Venture Investor, is filled with lots of technical boo-boo stuff, but I'm telling you, that will change your entire life. Like, it's worth the read, it's worth the listen. And so I actually listened to that before that set of negotiations, and it talks about things like, uh, what's called the straw man principle, which is like negotiating out of your like natural negotiation style. Like if someone's very aggressive, you get calm, all these different things. And then also it's just very technical around like what to do. So I was actually just going to sell, I had a, an LLC left over and I was going to sell the LLC. But so sentiment is um, an S Corp, right? Delaware S Corp. And actually what I did is I made an asset sale. So I, I technically could have taken the IP from Sentiment for Film Funder, put it back in my Film Funder LLC, sold the LLC to him, but I would have got like a tax impairment for that, right? So what I did is I took an asset sale, which made it a loss. So I get what's called a net operating loss. And so I can carry that even on my personal taxes. Hmm. And so that's how you can, as you get wealthier, like start to invert the tax system and it's part of the whole dynamic of America. But um, yeah, <laughs> just, that's a whole other conversation. So like, yeah, is, is this S, this is main S Corp, stripped an asset, which is just a couple of provisional patents off, packaged it up, sold it to this company. So, yeah. Wow. Okay, very cool. And how did you know how much to ask for? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways you can do that. And, you know, this thing I'm always talking about is the Berkus model. Um, and that's basically the market validation that you have for a principal. And then what other transactions in the space have actually resulted in that kind of sale. So like, if you've got like six, for me, it was like Porton.io, which is a company that's in our, in our space or in that space, um, to a certain degree, a couple of other assets in that space. And they were all like about top line number of $2 million. Now, when I say $2 million, <laughs> that's paid over a long period of time. And there's lots of different things. I ended up with way, 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 way less than that. But yeah, so it, it's all of those things. And I compared them on the market and I said, look, these are the same price. These are the same. This is what it's going to do for you. I think the key thing, which I take from Brad's book, though, is don't say market. Like this thing he says across the whole book is like whenever a lawyer or anyone says, oh, that's the market price, they don't know what they're doing. Hmm. Like it's about your conversation with the person. And in their case, they were like, look, we want some tech to move forward. Like, how do we do that? Let's do that. And so I was able to like retrofit the solution to what they were doing 
to move it forward. So. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like you focus on the value, but also you have data to back it up. Yeah. People like numbers yeah, people to, to validate numbers. things yeah. and justify it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it for part one of our conversation with Micah Brown. Tune in next week for part two, where you'll hear about how Micah started another company, which he sold, that he later parlayed into a career in venture capital. We'll see you next week.